We are fast approaching the greatest days of the year and they are great from a spiritual perspective but when you understand uh, how that spiritual um, status of those days will affect yourself on a physical level and on a mental level you'll realize that truly they are the best days for us uh, from all aspects in terms of our uh, physical being in terms of our mental well-being and of course in terms of our spiritual well-being what days am i talking about they are the days of dhul hijjah in particular the first 10 days of dhul hijjah which is the next month after dhul qi'dah which we are coming to the end uh, now and one of the interesting things uh, about this year and about these days is that they are coming on the back of this lockdown as we have been suffering from this pandemic one of the uh, consequences has been that because of the lockdown many of us if not all of us have been deprived of many things that have taken a serious toll on our spiritual well-being and affected our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I've been hearing from a lot of people that because they can't go to the masjids because they can't socialize with their fellow Muslim brothers and sisters their fellow Muslim sisters that sense of brotherhood and sisterhood uh, has affected their Iman and some people I've heard subhanAllah going through almost like a crisis where they feel like they no longer have the desire to pray they can't remember the last time they raised their hands to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and generally speaking being alone being isolated um, is a time the Prophet said you know where you're more vulnerable to the wiswas whisperings of the shaitan and therefore uh, these 10 days will be a huge welcome, will be a huge support inshallah if we know what they mean and appreciate them and act upon the teachings of our Prophet So, with regards to these 10 days we could find that even though we have been suffering because of all of these issues and more another one is financial worries as well subhanAllah a lot of people having to have difficult conversations with the employers if you're an employee um, you know, if you're an employer rather and you're having to have difficult conversation with your employees maybe having to let some of them go um, or having to cut down some of their hours and if you're on the other end of that then you're being told that I'm afraid there's no more work for you there's lots subhanAllah of things going on right now which are affecting us uh, in terms of our Iman and again I reiterate that these 10 days of Dhul Hijjah will inshallah become a source of great relief and almost escape as well now what are these 10 days these 10 days are the first 10 days of the month of the hijjah and we associate them primarily with the with that great act of worship which is known as al-hajj as we know that they culminate in a number of days of hajj beginning from uh, the 8th of the hijjah and then ending um, on for some people the 12th or some people the 13th and for people not making hajj the 10th day of the hijjah is known as the eid eid al-adha yes uh, known as the eid on which there is sacrifice and if you're a haji if you're a person doing hajj then it is the yom al-nahr and many scholars say that this day the 10th day of the hijjah is the greatest day of all the days of the year uh, because of a number of reasons, because mainly because of the fact that many of the major Hajj rites take place on that day. So if you are doing Hajj uh, on that day, you would be shaving or trimming your hair, you would be offering your sacrifice, you would be going to the Kaaba to perform your major, the major pillar of uh, doing Hajj. And so uh, that day would be uh, an incredibly, uh, you know, busy day, but also a day in which you're doing many acts of worship. But also this day for those not doing Hajj is a day of Eid, a day uh, of sacrifice and the sacrifice is linked to a tradition that doesn't go back to our Prophet only but actually precedes him, goes back further to this great, uh, you know, incredible figure, a human being, Prophet of Allah, Ibrahim salam. And so uh, both the Hajj, okay, and those that are not doing Hajj, offering a sacrifice known as a Qurbani, uh, both of those uh, traditions, those acts are going back to this one person, this one figure, uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam.
And so it's, I want to take some time just to talk about Ibrahim السلام, and try to capture some moments from his life that can inspire us, inshallah. Because we know that in these days, our main focus should be trying to lift our game when it comes to doing acts of worship. And those acts of worship could be to do with uh, praying more or when we pray to focus more, to make more dua, to fasting in these days uh, um, and making more dhikr and any other acts of kindness like giving sadaqah and you know piling on the good actions piling on the good deeds uh, will elevate your spiritual state your iman will go higher and that will then affect your mental state as well you know when your iman is high you feel good right you feel close to allah and that then relieves some kind of anxiety that you may be feeling or a state of depression that you may be in uh, and then that affects your uh, mood and then that affects your physical temperament as well you may feel like you're more active now you may feel like you know you want to go out and do more things uh, and so all of this is connected yes and we should look at ourselves as being like this uh, you know comprising of many parts the core of us being spiritual but then we're affected by the physical and the mental so let's talk about Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam is mentioned in the Quran by name uh, about 50, uh, 54 times and he even has a, a surah that's named after him, uh, Surah Ibrahim and interestingly he is the only person uh, beside uh, that the Prophet sallam is told to take as a role model. Now we, he's told in the Quran that when it comes to all the previous prophets Look at all of them, learn from their lives and take guidance. When it came to Ibrahim السلام, Allah subhanahu wa said to the person that in the conduct of Ibrahim السلام, you have a perfect role model. So in particular Allah said Ibrahim he stands out head and shoulders above others as being an uswa the Quran says and the word uswa literally means an object of, of, object of imitation. You know like how Today, people look at movie stars and pop stars and rap stars and sports stars and they're like, you know, I would like to be like that. I would like to dress like that. Allah is saying, for Muslims, you should be like Ibrahim. I would like to be like him. I would like to follow in his footsteps. And the person is being told that you should look up to him as an inspiration. You know, that's incredible. Uh, also, one of the interesting things about Ibrahim is that he lived quite a long life. So some scholars like Ibn Kathir said he lived for 175 years and in those 175 years he experienced incredible things, he achieved amazing things as well and uh, a, an easy way to look at his life is to break it down into three stages. So let's break it down into these three stages that Ibn Kathir kind of alludes to in his work al Bidha wa Niha. He says the first stage of his life was known in Arabic as Rushd, which means that before he became a prophet, he had this sense of right and wrong, of what was moral, what was immoral, what was pure and what was impure. And Allah spoke about this in the Quran where he said, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ رُشْدَهُ مِنْ قَبْلِ In Surah Ibrahim, Allah said, and no doubt about it, we gave Ibrahim his Rushd, which I'm not going to translate, from way before. And the scholars say, way before, min qabl refers to before he became a prophet. So what is this rush? Rush essentially means direction. But in the context of this verse, it, ref it refers to Ibrahim's ability to see right from wrong. And that's very important because Ibrahim uh, was born into uh, a civilization that only knew of, of polytheism, only knew of idol worship, of star worship of worshipping kings, of worshipping uh, stone made idols etc etc and so when you're born in a time, in a place where everyone uh, believes a set of values uh, that even though they are immoral and, and irrational and wrong the fact is that you as a one person individual will go along with that you know you won't really question that and Allah subhanahu wa said to Ibrahim that when he was growing up you know his father used to manufacture the idols which meant that his in in his own house, the predominant you know value and the things that he would see when he's growing up was his father making idols, selling idols, and so shirk was all around him. And yet Allah says, Ibrahim min qabl. And some historians they say that when Ibrahim, when he was growing up as a young boy, his father would give him some of these idols he would make and say, go to the market and sell them. And Ibrahim 
he would uh, parade these idols around mockingly say who would like to buy something that cannot benefit them and cannot harm them and then in one in one uh, narration he actually took one of these idols and uh, he went to the the sea or the river and he put it face down into the water and said drink drink if you are thirsty uh, just trying to make people see like what are we doing here worshiping something that is completely useless uh, cannot help itself how can it help us and then people obviously were outraged by this people you know put an X on his on his back and said this 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 one here we need to look out uh, for him you know he seems a bit crazy this was Ibrahim when he was young and that shows us as Muslims that we shouldn't be afraid to question the things that we see around us that are immoral even if they prevail even if they are dominant even if everyone seems to have one view on something but we know that actually that's wrong we should think of Ibrahim salam, that he was in a worse situation and yet he never kept silent in fact he chose to speak out against it and some of the scholars say even during this young age before he became a prophet he did that awesome uh, project of taking that axe and breaking the idols in the grand temple to make a big scene and cause a commotion not in order to just cause uh, an outrage but rather to get people to reflect over the fact that these idols are not worthy of their worship so even because we hope before becoming the prophet subhanallah he has done great things imagine then when he becomes a prophet so this is the second stage the first stage was as a young boy or a young man uh, and then the second stage is when he becomes a prophet this is the stage of nubuwa and in this stage he does many incredible things <laughs> one of them is that Ibrahim actually migrates a total of seven times according to some historians. Now, why is that such an amazing thing? We think of relocation as moving from one area to another area, maybe to a more affluent area, a place where there's better schools. Uh, I got a job, so I have to move another city. Ibrahim did not move for those reasons. He left or was kicked out because people could not tolerate him preaching about the truth anymore and subhanallah he his life they say he began in Babel which was the capital of Babylonia which was one of the greatest civilizations at the time and the, and the city Babel was known as the city of all cities it was like uh, I don't know like the Washington DC of the world of that time so he's born there uh, when he's growing up you know he goes against the status quo he starts to preach and then he gets kicked out and then because of that he goes to other places he goes to Egypt he goes to Palestine he goes to Syria and he ends up in Mecca and Mukarramah through the course of those 175 years he has to move seven times to seven different places and maybe more and each time he's driven by the desire to take the message of Islam and to give it to other people and as Muslims today, subhanAllah, we can learn a lot from this idea of migration. Yes, in Arabic we call this hijrah. He told us that there's a spiritual type of hijrah as well, which is where you may not physically move, but a muhajir is one who moves away from sin. And this is very important, that many of us have bad habits. Uh, many of those have bad habits happen inside the home. Um, in order to be, you know, classified as a muhajir, you know the muhajirun like muhajirun Makkah that went to Medina or to gain a status like that it is easier saying you know what I will move away from this bad habit and perhaps replace it with a good habit moving away from sin spiritually is a type of migration and the reward for migration is subhanallah a great one so Ibrahim salam, he migrates many times motivated to move away from evil people perhaps to find better people but also the second lesson for us is that he moved motivated to share the message of Islam and that means that we also following his example should consider ourselves ambassadors of Islam and many of you may be thinking well you know I'm, I don't really know much about Islam I'm not, I'm not a scholar I haven't been to an institute I don't know Arabic for example but subhanallah the Prophet said you know propagate from me even if it's just one verse we all know one teaching of Islam like we all know that for example honesty is a virtue we all know that cleanliness is half of our faith we all know we know so many things about Islam if you think about it and many of our colleagues at work 
our neighbors, uh, people on the street, they don't know about these things. And yet we keep quiet. No, we should choose moments where it's possible to strike up a conversation. It could be just an innocent one, a casual one, an icebreaker. But then with the intention that like Ibrahim alayhi salam, I'm going to try and share something about Islam. SubhanAllah, you know, you never know how your words could affect someone. We know historically speaking that there are some Muslim countries, say some say Indonesia is one of them, uh, whose Islam began because of Muslim traders coming, doing business, you know, doing business, but doing it with the Islamic approach, the Islamic teachings showing through their character and their manners, uh, things that people were astonished by. And because of that, they became interested in Islam. And then, subhanAllah, today Indonesia is one of the most popular Muslim countries in the world. Imagine the reward those initial Muslim traders would get uh, because a copy of everybody else's reward, inshallah, will go back to them. Now, this is Ibrahim is some second stage in his life where he's a prophet of Allah and he's doing incredible things. And, you know, here he debated the king Nimrod, Nimrud, and he left him flabbergasted. You know, the, the whole debate that took place and the king said, you know, Allah, I can make people come to life and I can make people die. And Ibrahim salam said, can you make the sun rise from the west? Because Allah can make it rise from the east. And, you know, the king was absolutely uh, gobsmacked. The Quran says, Ibrahim salam intellectually proving the superiority of Islamic teaching as well. And that's another a lesson for us that Subhanahu Ibrahim, it wasn't just a spiritual man who kept himself to himself, but rather Ibrahim salam used rational arguments. And we know that uh, the story where Ibrahim alayhi salam, he's now in a place, some said Kanaan, where the people used to worship the stars, believing them to be, uh, you know, all powerful. And today, some people have a similar belief where they believe the universe has a special power. And when they refer to the universe uh, as, as, as if they're at the helm of the universe, that the universe has a control over them, they may call out to the universe as if the universe is a God. A'udhu billahi min dhalik. So similar type of belief in Ibrahim alayhi salam, you know, he had that little, uh, some people say it was like a performance where, you know, he said, oh, look at the sun, uh, you know, the sun is the God, oh no, the moon is the God, the stars are the God, and eventually realizing supposedly that, look, the sun sets, and the moon vanishes, and the stars disappear, they can't be my God, Allah must be the God, yes, the Creator must be the God. So. In that time, he's doing da'wah, intellectually trying to prove Islam, intellectually trying to get people to think. And then the last stage of his life is what is known as khulla. And khulla comes, uh, means, uh, well, literally it means, from, it comes from the root word khalal, which means a flaw, it means a gap. But this is referring to Ibrahim becoming the Khalil or Rahman, becoming the friend of Allah. So how does the word Khalil from its root of khalal, which means a gap or a flaw, come together. Well, they say that khalil refers to a type of friendship where there's no gap between the two friends. Allahu Akbar. That Ibrahim salam, he became so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that literally no one from humanity uh, gained a closeness to Allah like Ibrahim salam. What Allah says in the Quran, and Allah certainly took Abraham as his intimate friend and we know that there were only two that were given that status and the second of them was the Prophet When did this happen for Ibrahim Some say towards the very end of his life and it's interesting that towards the end of his life you know things don't become easy for Ibrahim things actually become harder. Now one of the incredibly difficult things that he had to do was to sacrifice uh, his son and you may not be aware of this, but there is a debate within the Islamic tradition as to whether it was Ismail or Ishaq. Putting that to one side, the fact that as a parent you have to take a knife to your child to sacrifice them, to slaughter them, is something unimaginable. I mean, when parents go to restaurants and their young kids pick up a knife, you know, their heart starts to pound and they're like, hey, put that knife down, what's wrong with you? Imagine Allah showed Ibrahim in a dream. He says to his son, I keep seeing in my dream that I am slaughtering you. I'm sacrificing you. And he had that conversation with his son and his son responded. He said to his father, do what you have been ordered because seeing a dream when you're a prophet is actually a type of revelation. So it's like Allah telling Ibrahim this is what you do. This is what you need to do. And Ibrahim is then telling his son and his son is saying, look, it's from Allah and whatever Allah wants is good 
So do what you need to do, Dad. You'll find me to be patient. And, and he went through that. That it came to the point where Allah says in the Quran that Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, had to turn his son, uh, some say, face down because he couldn't bear the sight of looking at his son's face when he's in the process of trying to sacrifice him, putting the knife to his throat. But subhanAllah, as soon as he did, you know, no harm came to his son. Allah replaced his son with the ram and then the slaughter happened. And it's from that that the tradition of Qurbani of Eid al Adha uh, is practiced today by Muslims across the world, you know. The billion so Muslims around the world do that today and have been doing it, uh, do that on that day and have been doing it, uh, you know, down back to the time of the Prophet and that tradition goes all the way back to Ibrahim Salam. Ibrahim Salam lived like 2,000 years before the Prophet So we're looking at a tradition that is almost 5,000 years old. I mean, how great is Islam? You know, and how Islam, subhanAllah, connects us to these great figures. And this is how I want to end now, I just want to talk a bit more about how we are connected to Ibrahim alayhi salam. So, Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, again, some of these things you may you may know, uh, a lot of them I think you may not know. So, there is a, a family link between our Prophet وسلم, and Ibrahim alayhi salam. So, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had two wives, he had Sarah and Hajar. And from each of them, he had a son, Ismail and Ishaq. And from Ishaq, we have many Prophets. So, we have Ya'qub and Ya'qub has Yusuf alayhi salam. And then many uh, Israelite, uh, Bani Israel literally means the children uh, uh, of uh, the children Bani Israel. So, Il means Allah, so it means uh, the children who are the slaves of Allah. They had many prophets, but from Ismail, alayhi salam, uh, you find that there weren't that many prophets. Later on down the line, from him is a man whose name is Abdullah, the father of our Prophet, who is from the lineage of Ismail, who is the son of Ibrahim alayhi salam, is born. And so our Prophet salam, by way of lineage is connected to Ibrahim alayhi salam. But not just that, the person loved Ibrahim alayhi salam. So much so uh, that subhanAllah, um, when he had a son, so the Prophet had a son, in fact he had three sons, uh, he named one of them Ibrahim. And the morning after his wife uh, Khadija gave birth, he turned to his companions and he said uh, that tonight, uh, or last night rather, companions said, last night Allah blessed me with a son and I have chosen to name him after my father, Ibrahim, subhanAllah. And what is even more amazing is that during the night journey, you know the night journey where the Prophet went through each heaven and each heaven he saw a Prophet, so he saw Ibrahim salam. And when he came back and he related uh, that incident of seeing the prophets, uh, he said, and I saw Ibrahim and I resembled him more than any of his progeny. SubhanAllah, our prophet used to look very much like Ibrahim salam. This is how we are connected to Ibrahim salam. In fact, we call ourselves Muslim. Yes, we are the Muslimun. That is our label, that is our title literally means the ones who submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But did you know that that name Muslim, it was given to us by the Prophet No, it was given to us by Ibrahim alayhi salam. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Hajj verse number 78, Allah says that uh, he is the one who named you as Muslims from before. And scholars say from before means before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ibrahim named you, meaning named the followers of Muhammad Sallallahu to be Muslims. You know, so the followers of Moses, he didn't say my followers are Jews. Jesus never said my followers are Christians. The Prophet himself never said my followers are Muslims, rather Ibrahim said Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi your followers will be known as Muslims. So our name as Muslims goes back to our father, Ibrahim salam. That is how close uh, we are and in these days Dhul Hijjah on our mind should be Ibrahim salam. because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began the Hajj tradition through Ibrahim salam. Allah says in the Quran that announce to humanity that Hajj tradition has now been initiated. And in that time Ibrahim salam was in Makkah al-Mukarramah. There was nobody there. There were no hotels. There were no as you know, 
there was there was no Haram Sharif, there was nothing. There was no people. And Ibrahim alayhi salam, he said, Yo Allah, I'll make the call, but there's no one here. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, make the call and we will make it carry. And subhanAllah, could he have imagined? Maybe, yes, this year, 2020, uh, there are few people making Hajj because of the pandemic, but the year before and the year before that, 3 million, 2 million, sometimes 3.5 million Muslims making Hajj from all over the world, from the far west, from the far east, from south and north, Muslims come together to perform the Hajj rites, paying great amounts of money, traveling huge distances, and Ibrahim was would never have known that. But how true were the words of Allah, Ibrahim, make the call and I will make it reach. So subhanAllah, in these days, think about Ibrahim and Islam. Think about his sacrifices. Think about his struggles. Think about how he was determined and use that, you know, uh, take from that inspiration and then try to maximize your own good deeds in these days. This is what I will end with, that these 10 days, the person said, there are no days in which good deeds are more beloved to Allah then these 10 days which means that whatever you know if you fasted before fantastic but if you fast in these days wow if you read quran before amazing if you read quran these days you're not going to believe how much reward you're going to get you know so in these days make plans make time to do more acts of worship read more quran make more dua make dhikr you know simple tips subhanallah making dhikr the weather is nice there's morning adhkar there's evening adhkar if you don't know them, download the Fortress of a Muslim app or get the book and you can see morning words of remembrance that the person used to make and evening ones. So in the morning, you have your breakfast or before breakfast, go outside in the garden, go onto the balcony or at least look out of the window, look outside, see nature, look at the sky and then say those words of dhikr. Trust me, it will have an extra spiritual effect, especially Remember to say the the words that the Prophet taught us. Radiyatu billahi rabba wa bil Islam dina wa bi Muhammadin sallallahu alaihi wasallam nabiya, which means I am happy and I am pleased and content. Allah is my Rabb, Islam is my religion, and the person as being the Prophet. Say that three times. That is what the Prophet taught us to do. And say them, mean them, and feel them. Do other acts of kindness. Give sadaqa every single day. Think about a little bit of money that you can put to one side and give it in sadaqah. You can give it online or you can make a little charity box at home, put it in your house every day you wake up, take a few pounds out, put it in that box and inshallah at the end of it, give it to a masjid or give it to uh, somebody who's collecting money for charity and subhanAllah that will go, or that will be recorded like a daily sadaqah that you gave. And then inshallah on the 10th day, we'll celebrate Eid together and we can look back at those 10 days and think, you know what, those 10 days are really good. You know, I thought by Ibrahim I became inspired in more acts of worship. I feel good within myself. Inshallah, my scales will be heavy on the day of judgment. And all of this will grant, will, will allow you to, inshallah, elevate yourself and, and kind of get over that lull that we have ex been experiencing because of the lockdown, because of the uh, isolation, because of the fact that we have been away from each other and from away from the masjid. These are the ways in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unites the ummah and helps the ummah and gives us chances to recover and come back to him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of our good deeds. May Allah grant us inspiration and determination in these 10 days to make them the best 10 days of our life. May Allah accept all of our good deeds. Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters. Hope this video was helpful for you. This may help others too. So please consider sharing. And we will bring more videos in the future. Inshallah. So consider subscribing. And you won't miss any. Jazakallah khairan.